people engage with politics in all kinds of different ways and what motivates them to do this. What are the ideas behind the labels that we see constantly thrown around? People rarely have a coherent set of beliefs that inform these political decisions. And really, there's no reason that they should. In this conversation, we talk about some of the environmental conditions that influence people, especially the role of the media in shaping discourse, and then how that discourse manifests into real political power. Talk a little bit about your background, expertise. Sure. My name is Dina Rollinger. I am a professor of sociology. I mostly study digital media and political participation and social movements. I want to have kind of a broad general discussion about politics, get a more comprehensive understanding. Everything seems to just be condensed into Republican, Democrat, left, right, you know, all these, all these different ideologies and labels really just get compacted into a binary. And I want to separate those, try and get a better understanding of the whole landscape, the different political motivations people have, the different political engagements they have, and just try to get a, a better understanding of that. But before we even get there, I was wondering if you know this, if there's data on this, just how much political engagement do you think comes from an earnest analysis of people's values, and then how much of it is just kind of personality and vibes and culture? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question, but I think that's just too big of a question for social scientists to address in a meaningful way. So there's a tendency to do more bite-sized chunks, right? So you look at how do people identify politically along either a spectrum or do they identify with a party and then see what that means in terms of engagement. But the whole focus on vibes in the last few months, I think really captures that messy area where there's so much more to it than simply whether or not you identify with the Democratic or Republican Party, particularly in a moment where we know lots of folks are identifying more as independents, what for whatever that means, right? And, and accord, which varies dramatically according to the person and how they define what it means to be an independent. So the vibes mm -hmm. question catches that whole messy area that can potentially motivate people. So I could just talk about something really quickly that we just did um, some research with 18 to 29 year olds. We did a nationally representative survey with folks in the US in that age category. And one of the things that we found for this particular generation, which gets at the end of the millennials, but mostly the Zs, they talk about positive emotions. If they felt good about their engagement in the past and it could have been a religious activity, a civic activity or a political activity, they were more likely to get engaged in the future and more likely to express intention to vote. And it didn't matter, again, if you were a Democrat, a moderate or Republican, however they identified this feeling mattered as well. So there's this whole mushy area that social scientists have to try to um, unpack, but you can really only often get it one piece at a time. So vibes certainly in this case signals emotion and how people feel about things and whether that makes them want to engage. But that's certainly not the only part of that's only a piece of the equation and not the whole thing. I see. That makes sense to me. So your engagement kind of depends on what's available to you. A lot of people engage through their churches or their uh, social groups and whether it perfectly aligns with your values, maybe not, but that's your best engagement, I guess. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And so we talked to a lot of conservatives. So we did interviews with a subset of our respondents. And, you know, there were folks that were very connected to their church. Churches were important because, you know, young people move a lot. And so that can be the hub. You can just go to a similar church and then you've met a community. But they would sometimes just think of that very separate, separate from their political activities and orientations. And but again, found a lot of meaning in that. But we also know in this age group that your friendship and the groups that you're involved with also can affect not only what you get engaged in, but whether or not you tend to go get super engaged. And I'm thinking more of kind of like the you know 1960s and 70s when we had folks really engaged on the extremes, and that was in part you know we've learned from that era that folks would get radicalized. When they were involved in a group, you know, they're in that group, they're talking with one another, they've got these tight friendship networks, and then they decide they need to do more. And sometimes more is more violence. Sometimes it's just nonviolence and 
sitting in front of uh, buildings and other things or occupying spaces, but you know, there's all these pieces that affect what you do and why you're doing it. So let's get to the political discussion. We talked about the binary before. I've also seen it as sort of a, a, a coordination with like left, right and authoritarian versus libertarian, but I think it's way more complicated even than that. I think there's way more variables in this analysis of people's values that contribute to political engagement, identity, things like that. I think of it sort of as like a personality trait. They have groupings into the big five personalities, right? Like, so there's a whole bunch of smaller categories that you can kind of put people in, but there's some larger groupings that are useful to political scientists, I guess. We tend to think of heuristics, right? And media, what we talk about with other people and then what the narratives that we see and the things that politicians and interest groups and activist groups draw on are they use these heuristics to try to connect with us. And so, yes, thinking about people in terms of are they conservative or libertarian or are they you know, liberal or progressive or are they in this sort of mushy or moderate area where they're they have values, but they're also very pragmatic and want to make sure they are moving things forward effectively, even if it's incrementally. It's a nice heuristic, but as you said, it doesn't always get at what's happening because people hold a whole bunch of different points of view on issues that might affect voting or not. And we're certainly seeing that now in, in all the discussions where we're hearing about sort of the conflict in Israel and Palestine. What does this mean in terms of how are younger voters, particularly on the left, thinking of voting, right? So there's all this complexity and then how you feel in the summer might change in October when you're getting closer to election and you get to what we really have in the U.S., a pretty binary choice, right? You can certainly vote for other candidates, but the value of that can be more, feel more or less important depending on where you live, for sure. So you'll see in the news polls and they'll swing different ways depending on the week, depending on all kinds of random things like you're saying and I always felt very skeptical of that it seems ridiculous to me that people's opinions on these large political topics that to me are pretty deeply held values that change over long periods of time and when you get these polling questions that seem to probe at least at some of these values they seem to swing wildly through weeks months it doesn't make sense to me is that real yeah no I mean I think it is I I think to some extent, lots of folks are pragmatists. And so okay. how you feel in the summer, and if you were a college student and you were really engaged on campus, whether you were advocating for Palestine or advocating for Israel, how you're thinking about that is going could potentially change right as you get closer to the election. Because there's also this social movement component where you can pressure, as we saw, you know, activists did effectively pressure, in this case, the Democratic Party to try to address these issues in a more meaningful way. But as you get closer to the election, you have to choose sort of, are you in or are you out, right? Mm -hmm. That's a choice that you, you can certainly make. And we know that some people say, well, this issue is very important, but it's not the only issue that I care about. I also have these hierarchy of issues. And what does it mean if I don't vote? because of this one issue, what does it potentially mean for these other issues that are also important to me? And we certainly have seen some of that with our interviews. So these long campaigns that we often see, I've heard that they're kind of unique to America where we'll have like a year long campaign for president. Is that valuable then in that way where you can kind of push people in different ways and kind of, it takes longer to sort of consolidate around different political positions and there's value in giving that movement time? Yeah, I mean, I think social movements are always working. And what they do is they're always trying to take advantage of political opportunities. So what is the moment? What is the issue? What is the event where they can meaningfully push forward their cause? And so elections are absolutely something that they can take advantage of every two years in the U.S. If they had their way, most activists would say, yeah, let's keep these issues on the radar as long as possible, because that's great for fundraising, it's great for getting people engaged, and great, hopefully, for pressuring politicians to adopt our points of view and positions on issues, right? But it also is great increasingly for politicians, right? We keep seeing 
the length of time for which they're engaged in fundraising is increasing, right? So we see that there's just the constant fundraising. Uh, since I study groups on both sides of all kinds of issues, my phone has just been blowing up. I have to put on sleep focus at 5 p.m. because I've usually gotten at least a dozen requests from politicians on both sides asking me for money, not just federally, but within the state of Florida. Right? So there's there's something to be gained uh, from you know media outlets for covering these issues, something for activists, something for politicians. So I study the US, so I can't say for certain whether or not this is extending to other democratic countries, but I suspect that they see some links too. What's different about the US in particular is that we have we have a very open media system in terms of who can cover what and our ability of mainstream outlets to cover a range of political issues, some things that wouldn't get covered, for example, in Britain, right? And so that adds another dimension in which things can get on the radar, not only of politicians and of media, but also activists, where we feel all of this I don't want to think of it as noise, but it's certainly we hear a cacophony around a particular issue for a longer period of time than we probably did in the past. Okay. Grouping people is basically a heuristic for political engagement for politicians trying to figure out where people are aligned. Are these labels necessarily ideologies or are they just descriptions of these collection of traits that people have in the group? I think of it as a collection of ideas. So I think that's what makes it useful for media and politicians alike. Because if you think of conservatives and liberals as just giant groups where they're a collection of ideas, it allows you to flatten difference. And so if we were to look on the right, there's a whole range of folks that would identify with as being conservative, but might not necessarily agree with one another. It's sort of the genius for a, from a media perspective, if you're a partisan outlet that's looking to make money or a politician looking to make money for your next campaign, is if you can flatten difference and make it less about a particular one particular issue and instead of make it about sort of a bigger tent issue or some umbrella issue where it's like, hey, we all we all care about this because it it matters not just because of you know abortion or gun rights or anything one specific issue necessarily it's this whole it's just a whole collection of issues that you just put together and, and try to appeal to a larger group i guess let's start with those big tents the republicans are considered conservative and uh, the Democrats are, I don't know what they're considering, or liberal or progressive, or I'm sure there's a distinction between those two labels that we give to the, so let, yeah, just tell me kind of what values fall under those big umbrellas. I tend to think about it as issues rather than values, because I think individuals okay. have values, um, parties make place for values, but really what they're doing is using a host of issues to try to appeal to individuals, right? And so on the left, you can think about sort of the environment, LGBTQ plus rights, you know, gun control, um, abortion rights and reproductive justice, all labor. These are some of the really big issues that are on the right. And then you can sort of reverse that for uh, on the left, and then you can reverse that for the right. right? So you can think anti-abortion, um, uh, religious freedoms and religious rights, uh, gun rights, they're not opposed to environment regulation per se, but they would certainly think about it differently when think about the, the rights of individuals and businesses to develop so that the economy can flourish. So these are just you know, sort of different sets of issues that we think of as separate, but are not always necessarily separate. So there are certainly people, like if you watched the debate the other day, um, Kamala Harris made a point of saying, I'm a gun owner, right? So I support you know, gun control, but I'm also a gun owner and I have no intention of curtailing gun rights. And that was a really public stage where we saw a politician and Waltz did the same thing where they're trying to muddy some of that water, of course, for in their attempt to get into the White House. Sure. But I think of it as a really unique way in which we see 
some of the contrast that can exist in an individual. In this case, she's also representing a party, but she's making a play, not just to the people that already are on board that might have been like, I wish she wouldn't have said she owned a gun, but to a broader audience, because there's a huge number of folks that say, yeah, maybe I lean conservative, but there are things that I don't agree with here. And I think that's why abortion, it, since the Dobbs decision has been so interesting, because that's been playing out within what we consider really conservative states, where you see states like Ohio that I honestly, I mean, having studied the pro-life movement, this is one of the states in which where the pro-life movement was born. It's been for decades a test state where they tested and would pass sample legislation uh, to protect the lives of the unborn and then export it. And so this is to have a state like Ohio decide to preserve abortion rights was uh, on the muddiness of all of these issues and how people think about them on display. Sorry okay, if that we, was too long. <laughs> no, no, that was perfect. Yeah, yeah, and we can keep going with that. If you follow political debates or discussions, you'll often hear two levels of conversation. People talk about like what should be done as a society, basically in terms of regulations and laws, and then like what I personally think should be done, what I what I would do as an individual. And I think this is perfect for abortion because I think there's many people who personally find would never get an abortion. Like that, that's their personally had values are very much against that, but. They don't necessarily want to ban it for other people as a society thing because they value the freedom for other people to make their own decisions for that. I tend to see left political activists talking more society levels, how we change things oh. through culture through the and or and how we change things through legislation. And I see conservative media promoting individual activities to change the goal. Like they, they don't necessarily want to legislate anything. They just want everyone together to behave a certain way, like personally, rather than oh, I got you. Okay, so I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, I mean, I think abortion is a really interesting one because in the Roe versus Wade era, what was so fascinating is how both sides, I always thought it was interesting as someone that's been studying for this for a long time, time is they would look at the Gallup poll and what you see is, you know, there are folks that there was this, they called it both sides of, both activists, activists on both sides would call it this mushy middle, right? Where you have, um, folks that are supportive of abortion rights, but only up to a point. And so they think that there should certainly be some restrictions. So it was fascinating when I interview activists and they would say, they would look at the exact same Gallup poll and say, look, the majority of Americans support abortion rights. And then the, uh, the other side, the pro-lifers would say, look, the majority of Americans support you know, some restrictions on abortions. And so there is this giant mushy middle, which gets back to what we were saying before, where people are, how they think about any particular issue is really complicated. It's it's complex. And if you support legal abortion, um, some of that, and you're religious as well, as we know many Americans are, it might be based on a personal experience you had or a family member or a friend or what you were saying. It's like, okay, my choice I have my choice and I'm never going to have an abortion, but I'm certainly not going to dictate that choice to someone else. They have to live with their own decisions. And if you're coming at it from a relig religious perspective, then you know, your come judgment, your judgment day, then that will be something that you have to address with God, right? So there's all this complexity and all these very hot button issues. But that's why we see, you know, the rhetoric is just intended to inflame. Right? It, if they can get you mad first, anger, anger subsides. So if you can just get people mad long enough that maybe they donate money to your campaign or they share whatever thing has outraged them, then that's a success because people aren't going to stay angry forever. They're going to move on. And if they really care about an issue, they'll find more meaningful ways to get engaged. But that's why you know, when we talk about a polarized political environment, it's not all people, right? A lot of folks consider themselves in that middle and just want to know what's real, what is truth, what are some of the facts that they feel like they can rely on so that they can make the decisions outside of all the actors that are benefiting from all the rage, regardless of the party or cause. Yeah. In terms of ideologies, I, I don't think people have coherent ideologies that they track to 
individual positions and what you're saying here they're not even coherent necessarily within one position yeah right yeah. and that's why it, that's why political advertising doesn't go into deal in much detail about anything right because okay. of all that nuance because of all the complexity they're trying to create that gut emotion that the anger the outrage to get you to respond or engage because of all of the complexity about in terms of how we feel about any given issue and particularly relative to other issues. I see. So they're just trying to get a what is the issue that's higher up there on the on your hierarchy of issues that you care about? Can they get you angry enough or outrage you enough for that moment to get you to do something else? And digital technologies are fantastic for that. I mean, I get so much rage mail every day on you know, both sides of the political spectrum, it's pretty shocking. I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of emails that I've analyzed as a result. So great research opportunity, but I could see where it'd be um, pretty upsetting if I had to live there every day. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then uh, to go with the political messaging. So I, yes, most political messaging, I, I agree, is kind of just platitudes and this sort of fuzzy messaging generally towards an idea try and cast as big a net as possible to get as many people on your side as you can but uh to contrast that uh i'm gonna say like bernie sanders campaign years ago he at least ostensibly took the very different approach where he came out and just said i'm gonna get you 50 dollars an hour i'm gonna get these labor laws pass and he had very concrete positions that he could point to and specific things mm -hmm. um so i was just wondering about political messaging is, is there I suppose there's value in both things, but do people respond better to one or the other? What, how, how do we think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a great question. It's what I've been thinking about, particularly since, since the last debate and then how people have responded to this recent presidential debate. And I, you know, one of the criticisms of our two candidates is they are not very specific about things. But I think that the, yeah. I don't think there's a win, there's any way to win these days, at least when you're thinking about the public facing political persona. And I say that because people take clips of what you've said and then can alter them or just decontextualize one thing that you said. I don't know that there's any incentive to provide the level of detail anymore. I think there's a lot of incentive to be very, very careful about what you say, if you can, and always thinking about what is that five to 10 second clip that can be uh, extracted from any public thing that you do that will then be circulated on every platform. Yeah, so, they're used negatively mostly, yeah, right? Well, well, right, and I think that's why we don't see as, as we don't see the hard policy positions like what we used to from politicians when they're talking. So maybe you can get more detail if you go to a website or if you're if the party is putting out mm -hmm. some kind of um, white paper, then you might get some more detail. But in terms of what they say or do on this on the campaign trail or in a debate, it's going to be pretty generic and trying to appeal in some way to a broader audience. Particularly since you know we, it sounds like we're both pretty entrenched in politics and are paying attention. But most people aren't. They're just now saying, "Oh yeah, presidential election coming up. I should probably start paying attention and get to know the candidates and what are the issues." And so I am certain that there are some subset of folks that say, "Yeah, I really want to know what this is." Particularly because we know that there's increasingly our distrust in politicians and political institutions has unfortunately grown. And so I think there's this important tension that you're hinting at where, yes, people are skeptical. They want to know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So I think of like kind of Elizabeth Warren when she ran and had a plan, a detailed plan for everything. So which, yeah. you know, some people said you need to get out of the weeds, right? You need to just talk more broadly about things. So I think that there are folks that are looking for, okay, I'm tired of listening to your platitudes. I'm tired of saying this is what you're going to do. I want to know, is this actually going to be something that can be done and benefit me and my family? But we're in an, a media environment where it doesn't benefit them to do that at all. Let's uh, continue with the, the media then. I, I, so I rarely watch straight politicians, whatever they're presenting to the public. I rarely watch that. I'll watch some 
media show that I like and I trust, and they kind of filter the information for me that seems relevant because, well, I suppose I watch them mostly because they align with my values or perspective politically. And I suppose most people do this. Is that right? It depends. There's okay. a lot of variability in it. So there are certainly some folks that get really entrenched in their media diets, but there are a lot of omnivores, media omnivores, I think of them as, where they're trying to consume something that's a, a, a broader range of media, particularly it seems on issues that they care about. So if someone cares about the environment, there certainly might be, you know, a so a channel on YouTube that they're following and or something that they like that makes that important and on social media following activists, but might also turn in to see, tune in to see what the other side is saying about a particular issue. Um, that's one of the things that um, I find frustrating about audiences is there's in the literature, there's a whole lot of debate about are there the are people just getting more polarized because of their media consumption? And Yes, some people absolutely are, but there are some people that absolutely are not. A grad student and I just did some research on this where we actually looked at around the 2020 election, we looked at the Arizona audit debate uh, when it was then Twitter. And one of the things that we, when we looked at the audiences and who was comprised of different kinds of audiences, we found that conservatives had really diverse diets. Some of that might just be because um, not all the conservatives were clearly on board with Trump and his argument that the election was stolen. But I think generally speaking, what Pew will sometimes, you know, Pew reviews, Pew Research Center will find is that, yeah, I mean, people have more diverse diets than we like to think. And that certainly when we were, that was one of the things we included in our survey for our young adults and we asked them about, people were looking for, and we didn't ask what, how they define this because we had a finite amount of time, but they're looking for facts, they're looking for truth. And I don't know what that means for a particular individual, but they're looking wider, far, further afield than you would think. You think people are looking for facts or narratives? I think they're probably looking for a bit of both, right? Narratives okay. are stories, humans love stories. So we have the stories that we like and that we agree with, and sometimes we have to we think, oh, are there other stories? Are there other tales that are told about this issue? So I think that there's certainly that. I think there can be facts put out everywhere. People are just looking for reliable sources. And I, on the one hand, I think that this is good because folks are thinking about how data are collected and being used in the ways that we didn't think about in, you know, decades ago. So I always think about how you know, we used to be terrified about the planes crashing or falling from the sky. We were worried and worried. I remember being a kid and thinking, oh my gosh, I hope we never have to fly because it's you know, the accidents, the airline accidents. But actually now we know, okay, this is actually a small percentage. And we think about media narratives regarding how facts are displayed and are they showing us the whole graph or just part of it? So in some ways we're better consumers and we're better understanders of data, uh, particularly if we're skeptical. But I think it would be nice if we had a shared space like we used to, where we used we used to have at least some common information that we were processing together. And that's what that's just kind of a result of our com complicated and media ecosystem where you have abundancy of choices and people creating their own notions of fact and anybody can create a website and put some numbers in a table, right? So we used to just have our broadcast news or and maybe then a few cable stations so we at least were getting some shared information to process and argue over now we're not even talking about the same data sources sometimes right so if we can't even agree on sources of data to fight about that's a problem right we we need to find something to a, a shared pool of resources to, or d information resources to fight over or fight about to, so that we can think about decision making in a more productive way. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at with the narrative because you'll see the same event portrayed on different medias, same, even sometimes the same facts, but sometimes they'll pick different facts from the same thing, right? So, one of the things that I've been looking at is a lot of headlines. And what I found so interesting, and I know there's a clickbait aspect to it, but not always, is 
the head, there's such a huge disconnect between the headline and the actual story. So sometimes you'll have these very extremely ideological, incorrect headlines, but then the story is pretty good. But if you're only reading the headline, which we know people do, <laughs> then what you're taking from the story that you didn't read is, a, is actually not what you should be taking from it. But you know, headlines are supposed to get you to read, but they, they don't always, but that is part of the narrative, right? So we want, we're trying to craft a narrative that resonates with an identity. Some of it, you know, we want the, the outlet makes money, the politician can make money, an interest group can make money if they can generate this rage, but not all of that narrative is always consistent. So you might have this very, uh, again, just um, emotional, emotionally laced headline where the story is actually much better and and pretty like i said it's actually pretty good most issues i suppose aren't really portrayed well as just a set of facts right they're so complex uh, i can think of like the the wars the the two big wars that the us is you know involved in that you can't you can't have all the facts. What what matters is the narrative, and each side constructs a narrative based on the facts that they find important. Do do they just pick the one that they like? Do people shop around for different narratives and kind of see what other people are saying? Or I I definitely tend to listen to people more who fit my biases, not just because it feels good and it fits my bias, but because there's so many assumptions baked into some of the other narratives that I don't agree with. That it seems like a waste of time. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, again, you're getting at that. Some of it's sort of your personal orientation to how you respond to narratives and how you seek them out. And so there, again, can be folks that say, yeah, I mean, this is not the, the starting place, their foundation. I'm not there. So the yeah. narratives that they're producing, I'm not there. One of the things that I find really interesting that social scientists have been looking at for over a decade is how narratives increasingly can come from the mar kind of the margins of the media system. So the most kind of partisan outlets and build steam and increasingly mm -hmm. get into more mainstream audiences, get to more mainstream audiences. So that's something that has fundamentally changed. So when you think about narrative, I think one of the things that we tend to do, and I, again, I've already talked about why the value of creating extreme narratives but they move in ways, they cross over from outlets in ways that they didn't in the past. And that fuzzies this whole narrative environment as well. Yeah, I've heard about that. People worry about that as part of the polarization where the, the more centralized ones kind of uh, sanitize some of the extreme positions as they filter in. Right, and we don't have that shared space anymore, right? So it used to be we had outlets that we were attending to where we had spaces. I mean, I don't really think of, um, you know, any of our social media platforms, including X's spaces where people are having meaningful debates. There's, there's plenty of yelling or exclamation points and, and rhetoric to try to get uh, likes and shares, but there's not that kind of public forum where consensus is made. In fact, you know, because we have parties where consensus is no longer desirable because you're in, the other side is your enemy, This the narratives on each side are just going to increasingly get insular. Unless, I mean, I would argue mostly us, unless we do something about it, right? The person, we can't do anything about the perverse incentives unless enough of us change our behavior in ways that are going to then make the perverse incentives change as well, right? You, you'll see this competing over the narrative from both sides as well as I was thinking of uh, particularly over naming things is where mm -hmm. it becomes very apparent to me. So like Obamacare versus the Affordable Care Act, I know was a big one. And I saw an interview with, uh, he was a Republican strategist and he was really proud that he got the estate tax into the public lexicon as named the death tax. You know, these very kind of simple messaging is really, I guess, dominates the discussion yeah, well, and whoever frames the debate gets to, you're, yeah. you're saying, here's how, the, this is the problem. This is how we need to understand the problem, which fundamentally shapes how you solve the problem, right? So there's a yeah. lot of, yeah, there's a lot of value in shaping the debate or getting the language adopted that you adopted that you want. And that's why, so, you know, activists, sometimes they realize they can't get 
They're not going to get the change that they want, but if they get the first step is just getting the language used that you want, then that's the that's the first step on the road of getting the actual change, right? You have to be able to, to first get your issue and how you think about it as part of the political lexicon, maybe popular lexicon, and then you have a chance to actually shape the solutions because now they've adopted your framework for understanding the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I want to ask a question about that. So for me, the, the obvious example for that, at least based on my values, is immigration. Is every question when they ask candidates these days about immigration, it's framed as this is a bad thing. Like there's too much. It's a, and I feel like every question, the assumption is, what do we do about it? How do we stop it? <laughs> Yeah, no, immigration has, it's, it's so interesting how it's changed over time, right? It's like, well, immigration used to be something that, you know, it was a good thing. It happened. You want more people and with more ideas coming into the U.S. You want part of the thing that makes the U.S. the most powerful and best country in the entire world, right, is that we have this diverse population uh, that's working together. And then, you know, now we have seen what's happening on the borders and what's happening in other countries has be made immigration bad. And the one thing I was thinking about, this is totally off topic, sorry, but I've just been thinking about, it's like, I wonder how libertarians are thinking about immigration right now, because libertarians typically think about, you know, yeah, you would have an open border, but because for everyone, immigration is regarded as a problem. I think not everyone agrees with that. They would say immigration and what's happening at the border, we, these are two separate issues. But for the purposes of election, I think, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, these are conflated. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, it's like, it's uh -huh. a heuristic. It's like, what is the most salient part of immigration right now? What's happening on the border? And so that's what takes up, that's the narrative that is getting all the space right now, taking up all the the energy of our politicians and our media pundits and everyone else. Okay, that, okay. that sounds right to me. I haven't thought about it that way. I want to go just pick up some odds and ends, some kind of maybe speculative questions. I was wondering how people shift their perspective over time. There's kind of a, a common thought that people get more conservative over time as they get older. Is that true? Is there a reason for that? Yeah, it depends on how you operationalize it. <laughs> Really? Yeah. So there is this sort of um, narrative that as you get, what is that saying? Um, if you're not liberal when you're 20, then you're heartless. But if you're, yeah. you know, not conservative, yeah. you're like 30 or 40 or whatever it is, then you're uh, yeah, brainless or something, or yeah. something like that. So and, it, and it, I'm just thinking over a longer term in terms of the life course is that certainly that is true of some people, but it's not true of everyone. So one of the things we also think about is just like, so act, you're an activist when you're young and you're a worker, you know, you, you're employed and you're a worker when you're older. So if you have a full-time job, you're certainly not engaged in any kind of activism. You're not out attending rallies, but that's not true. There are certain people, but because of what you talked about earlier, their values that they make time for it. They use their vacations and the, they use their vacation days to attend a protest as opposed to go to Hawaii or wherever people are going. And the same is true with age. So there are certainly folks that tend to get more conservative. So you'll have liberals that turn conservatives, but you can also have conservatives that get more liberal. So it's a great heuristic. It's a nice tale to tell, but it's not totally accurate. <laughs> and I, I guess more generally, what kinds of things might cause a, a change in people's political values? Maybe that's the way to think about it. Mostly personal things or are there big cultural things that often also shift? Yeah, so some um, social scientists, including myself, argued that generation matters. So it's as you're coming to age, that moment that you're in, it affects how you understand engagement for the rest of your life. So like I've studied women that came of age in the 1960s, and then and it didn't matter if they were conservative or liberal, what did, in terms of like what how they identified then and how they identify now, but it, it was really clear it shaped how they understood, in this case, it was gender. And they would say, well, I'm not, conservative women would say, I'm not a feminist, but I do think women should have these rights. And so they had this shared set of experiences um, in terms of like the history making of the moment that affected how they saw change. And so there has been research that has shown that so Generation X 
their participation looks differently from baby boomers. Similarly, even among millennials and Gen Z, there's differences in terms of you know, their support. So Gen Z is even more supportive of, of LGBTQ plus issues than even millennials and more concerned about the environment. So these generations, things are happening. And even if we just think about our digital environments, all of this stuff that happens economically, politically, socially around us affects how we understand the world and how we think about affecting change, which affects how we participate in a variety of ways. Mm, they'll stick with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they really do. I mean, there's folks that have done studies, longitudinal studies where they'll look at people that you know came of age in the 60s and then interviewed them again in the 80s. And so if they were lefty activists in the 60s and 70s, they had they were more likely to be social workers and teachers in these health professions in the 1980s because that was a value that they developed and they took forward and, and affected literally the rest of their lives, including their employment. I was wondering if you can just what's your perspective on what you think are the big political issues this season or just generally in America, maybe they're not actually that well described by the political debate right now, the presidential debate. So just what do you think are sort of the important issues that America? Yeah, no, I mean, I think some of this is going to be important in terms of the state that you're in, right? So I think about, yeah. I'm in Florida, and so we have two amendments. We have Amendment 3, that's for you know legal recreational use of marijuana, and 4, which is basically to try to reinstate Roe versus Wade, where you can have abortion up to the 24-week mark or viability. And so I think in the state of Florida, yes, there'll be people that just care about the presidential politics, but that's going to move people too. We tend to think about just things on the national stage? What are the overarching national issues that everyone cares about? But that's the people don't live on the national stage, right? They live in communities and they live in states. And so these are going to be, I think, more influential. And so, of course, absolutely could be wrong. And then everyone will be like, oh, the economy and who, whoever they think should come out on the economy. But I, when I think about what people are talking about, and I hear people talking about in the state of Florida, it's Certainly, yes, yeah, some of the economy people complaining about cost of living, but they're also thinking about these other ballot issues. And Florida is by no means the only state in which there's important issues, including sort of abortion that are on, on the ballot. So I think that'll be a big a big motivator this year. So yeah, maybe abortion's not the issue everywhere, but in a lot of places. I yeah, think. it is. There's a lot of it's on a lot of state ballots this year. And groups know this. So they time they try to time some of these ballot initiatives if you're in a state where you can have one with presidential elections in hopes that it'll drive out more folks that will you know support that and then hopefully the candidates who claim credit or claim to also support that ballot initiative. And then just uh, what topics issues do you find personally important or do you think are important for people in your field to sort of be interested in researching what big political topics, but also, I guess, you know, related to your job of investigating political discourse. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I've been really interested in thinking about the role of digital technologies and affecting participation or understanding of issues. Like we've talked about, I mean, there's this really, we tend to use a sledgehammer when we're understanding how these things matter. Like when I was talking about audiences, that's been something that's very interesting to me because we think about there's outlets and individuals that folks are following on social media and they everyone that follows them agrees. And we don't actually see how do you know, different kinds of influencers and outlets cluster together and who is actually following them or how do digital technologies matter? I mean, what we know that digital technologies have certainly benefited folks that have the resources to take advantage of them. But what does that mean in terms of how we engage? Is it changing over time? How, like you said, we understand narratives. And, and now, since we can participate in these narratives, how do we participate? Do we push back or do we just disengage or find a different form to go to where we feel like there's less pressure to adopt a particular perspective? I mean, I've certainly been looking at forms across the political spectrum and in the middle and if you want to have a reasoned conversation, there's not a lot of places to go, at least in terms of like the news 
form sites. Maybe there's better places on Reddit. I mean, this is an empirical question to ask, but what are the people, there's so many moderates in the US, where are they going? How are they understanding what to do? And maybe what do they see as the meaningful step forward so that they can get what they want in terms of information and participation and then understanding how they might shape the world, whatever that means to them in ways that seem important and meaningful. And so that's sort of where, where I am. And I'm really entrenched in kind of those, a lot of different projects related to that. So it's hard for me to think about what else should we be doing when those feel okay. like pretty big questions <laughs> right now that I'm addressing. So I just had a podcast where we talked about uh, democracy and just some general principles of that, that gave me a thought of the this idea of um, feedback and the, the, you'll hear like the politician they won't necessarily do something they'll just say something mm -hmm. and you'll get this swarm of media in response to what they said and I suppose that depends on the media like you're saying but I think that's a very valuable part of democracy right having this quick immediate feedback that like has more voices as well and that depends on the media that we have today. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see, maybe AI will be helpful with this, but maybe not because you have more bots. But you know, yeah. politicians aren't good at processing feedback. And so there okay. might be things that we can do. Right? I mean, if you think about it, if you have a, an account, any account, and it doesn't matter where it is, but how are you supposed to oh. process 100,000 comments in any kind of meaningful way so that you understand it? So you'll have the haters and the lovers and then some in the between, but is there something that they can take from that? But that's always, that's a long-term problem, right? So when people were just sending email, exact same problem. When they were sending letters, same problem. How do, okay. how can they meaningfully take feedback from us? Right now, the assumption is that, um, we can use these proxies, look at social media as a proxy for that. They, or they'll look at it as a proxy likes or reshares or whatever they're doing, but that they're not really getting that feedback from us. And there, I am certain that there's a better way for them to do it, but there's probably a better way for us to do it too. Yeah. Like thinking about how we're delivering feedback and what might actually break through some of the clutter that they get, something even the mass email campaigns. And those yeah. sorts of things. So I'm 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 always an optimist. So I'm optimistic that we are up for the challenges and that civil society will will figure out how to keep it robust and flourishing and make some adjustments. Uh, because again, I study both sides and you know the ways in which digital technologies are being used by actors with power, whether it's interest groups or social movement groups or political parties or just politicians, is not beneficial to us. And it makes it harder for us to sort through and figure out how to participate and engage in meaningful ways. But understanding that, I guess, is the first part of the problem. And then thinking through what are things that we can do? And we, I, I mean, there's a lot of political scientists that talk about the meaningful work that you can do within communities. And I think that's one thing that we can do as individuals instead of participating in a group or a rally that's a sister rally to something in, in DC, if we're focusing on the things that we care about collectively, like the playgrounds or what or trash pickup or what whatever it is within our own communities and putting our time and energy there, some of this other stuff will be, get easier to do. Some of the rhetoric might die down a bit. Okay. But again, I'm an optimist. Your optimism uh, makes me optimistic. Oh, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like I get that message mostly when I talk to people in the field. They, they're the people who are engaging with this every day. They're always optimistic, and I appreciate that actually. So thank you. Yeah.